John, good to see you. Good to see you too, David. So, John, in your book, you write very fondly about uh, being born in West Virginia, where you had an uncle who was, I guess, sort of tangentially into the cable business in the early days. Yep, he strung a wire. Bit. And you moved to Alabama. You had a connection with the space industry. When did you get the idea of putting it all together into the <laughs> Discovery Channel? Well, I think it all started for me when I was just a kid. I was uh, fascinated even at the age of five with a little book that I write about in the, uh, in the story um, called A Trip to the Moon by Tom Corbett. And lo and behold, I remember when uh, the Russians lost, launched their first satellite, Sputnik. In West Virginia, we could hear the beep, beep, beep as it went over on radio. And lo and behold, my father was a, a builder and got an uh, opportunity to move to Huntsville, Alabama, where they were building the Saturn V rocket eventually that would take man to the moon. So I was very much inspired by the space program, paid a lot of attention to satellites. Um, early on, I read about Arthur C. Clarke, who back in the late 40s you know, predicted that with just three satellites in orbit, you could blanket the globe mm -hmm. with communications. Uh, but it all didn't come together for me for a discovery or that first little glimpse of an idea until I was in college and I was aware of a rich supply of documentary product by the BBC and others around the country. Well, around in the college, world. you were a history major. Yes. Well, what made you decide to go into history instead of some field like engineering? Or? Well, I loved history, but also loved science and technology. And at that time, there was the, the start of a new area of study called the history of science and technology. And so at uh, my university, was, I was at the University of Alabama in Huntsville, we invited the first author of the textbook on the history of science and technology to come speak. So I was taking courses in history, but by the time I finished college, I almost had enough to minor in astronomy. And, but in the history department, I was fortunate to get a job. Of, I had a little work study job. And my task was to get in books for the faculty members to use and assign. Um, so they had preview books. So I would order, I'd have catalogs of publishers that I would get content in from. But also they would use 16 millimeter films in the classroom uh, to illustrate certain points in French history, Russian history, American history. And so my job was to get those 16 millimeter films in. And so in my little work cubicle, I had these catalogs of documentaries and being curious about all of them. I wanted to see all of them. And I uh, just had that little thought even back then, why can't this be on television? And so that was a thought that stayed with me almost throughout my 20s. And these were all on film, right? These were all 16, 16 millimeter, millimeter films. You'd order them, they came in a canister. Right. You'd have to set up a projector and um, you could rent them for five days and then the university could show them as many times as, you, as they wanted during that five-day period, then package the films up and send them back to the distributor. Now, when I think of 1974 as a very political time, Watergate, the uh, Vietnam War, did that touch you at all, or what was your campus like? Well, I mean, it was, that was right in the middle of the, a lot of the uh, campus unrest. Uh, didn't touch too much in, in Huntsville, where, where I was. I remember my, my first year at the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa. And uh, yeah, the, the country was in turmoil. There was very few of us in college that time that supported the war. Right. And so fortunately, it started to wind down. We all, you know, with bated breath, waited the lottery. There was a lottery right. back then. And I remember the night that the lottery for my class came up. And we were, you were almost certain if you uh, got a lottery number of uh, 1 to 125 of being called up and off you would go to Vietnam. and. There was 365 days of the year. They had two bowls. Mm -hmm. One would have your birthday in it, and one would have a number, the numbers, one through 365. And so l they picked out number 352 and then my birth date. Oh. And so I didn't go to Vietnam. Yeah. You're very, very lucky. And then at, when you graduated college, you didn't go into history. Uh, you didn't go into uh, no, science. I didn't know, no, I didn't know whether to go into law school or graduate school in history. and. I was just, I uh, had a little research grant when I was a senior to do kind of a history of the, all of the Native American settlements, Cherokee settlements that had been uh, covered up by the damming of the Tennessee River. And lo and behold, TVA, who was the sponsor of the study, published it. Mm -hmm. And so I, I got to, uh, to meet the president of the university. And so when he heard I decided, I was undecided about what to do, 
uh, going to law school or to graduate school at history, he offered me a job. Mm -hmm. And it was a job that um, I would go to Washington, write grant proposals, and try to bring back federal money for the university. So I took that job, and then um, after about a year, one of my proposals beat out one by the University of Maryland. They uh, retaliated by offering me a job, and that got me up to the Washington area. And <clears throat> then let's fast forward a bit to when you started Discovery. You became yeah. a businessman. You had no background in management, no background in finance, no background in marketing. What made you think that you could do it? Well, I was just confident that, you know, it's amazing when you read books. <laughs> and there was a book about, you know, how to write a business plan. I'd only had a few marketing courses in college, economic courses. But I was just so fascinated um, by a turn of events that happened in 1975. And that was when HBO challenged the existing law of the land. So remarkably, before 1975, cable operators were not allowed to do anything with content other than provide a, a retransmission of local broadcast content. So they couldn't originate content of their own. And so HBO, uh, which started as a movie service in a local cable system in Manhattan, had aspirations to go on satellite and be available to cable operators across the country. Well, immediately the broadcasters and the FCC brought suit. The court case wound its way all the way to the Supreme Court. And in 1975, I was in Washington. I remember seeing an article above the fold in the Washington Post saying that the Supreme Court had ruled that would-be cable network owners uh, had First Amendment rights and no laws could stand in the way of a new cable network being launched and the consumer. So HBO was legal. And so I started thinking even at that time, not as an entrepreneur, but as a consumer. Well, when are they going to create my favorite kind of channel, which would be a documentary channel about science, nature, human adventure, history, and no one did. And by 1982, you know, as most entrepreneurs do, you get obsessed by mm -hmm. an idea. And so since nobody was uh, doing it, I started researching everything I could read about the industry, trying to become an expert on satellite technology, cable system design, the, how they design their systems, and, but most importantly, how to source documentary content right. from suppliers around the world. And you didn't feel at any point, gee, I'm over my head, what am I doing? Um, no, I didn't. And I've, uh, in re retrospect, I think there's an enormous advantage in coming into an industry from the outside. In, in one way, you're not burdened by all the knowledge of the insiders right. who've convinced them not to do such a thing. <laughs> And so it was, you know, you're able to just see more things, I believe, from the outside. Mm -hmm. And so, again, you, you know, with a lot of study, and if you'd seen me in the year 1983, I was a student of the, of the cable industry and the broadcast industry. And then I developed my business plan, and then I set about the difficult task of raising the money, which for, you know, this wasn't like setting up a little bagel shop as an entrepreneur in, in local town with 100000 or 200000 in capital. I needed $25 million to launch Discovery. Right, and in fact, you write that uh, this was your biggest hurdle. You almost went bankrupt oh, yeah, at one point. Yeah, I think, cap you know, uh, that's the biggest challenge for an entrepreneur is to find the resources to launch your business. I mean, there's pr few entrepreneurs are lucky enough to be born, you know, in a household with enormous wealth that can fund a $10 million undertaking. And so most of us come from, you know, you know, uh, humble beginnings or middle income beginnings where we don't have those kind of resources. So that's the challenge. And so you have to be introduced to companies and to people who can write $100,000 checks. And that's, a, that's I write about that extensively in the book about right. how to network and make those connections to finally you can get introduced to either a venture capitalist or an investment banking firm and uh, to start raising the money to help fulfill your dreams. Is it easier now? I mean, you read all the time about uh, tech startups with lots of people offering them money, first round, second round. Do you think that it was harder to raise money back Well, it, seemed to be, it seems now to be more formalized that you can go and, it's, and, and get a hearing at a venture capital firm. Mm -hmm. you, might, you might not be successful and you may only get 10 minutes to pitch your case. But at the time I was raising money, it um, was a lot of personal connections that was involved. You had to be introduced by somebody who could vouch for you, vouch for your idea, someone who thought it was a good idea. 
And so uh, my break came when, through a number of introductions, I met a gentleman named Harry Haggerty, mm -hmm. who was one of the co-founders of Digital Switch Corporation, which was based in Washington, D.C. And they, made, they were the first to, to make digital switching devices for telephone companies. And he was convinced the world was going to go digital and the cable, uh, excuse me, uh, for telephone companies. Mm -hmm. right. And so um, that's what that company did. It was a huge success story. His investment bank was Allen & Company in New York. Right. And so I'm, someone, uh, I got a connection. I met Harry Haggerty. And then he was the one then that took me to Allen & Company, introduced me and the idea for the Discovery Channel. Walter Cronkite was also uh, instrumental in yes, that process. Yes. Yeah, and in, even when I was meeting with Harry uh, the first time about the concept and I was pitching the idea of a Discovery Channel, um, he was, uh, he said, you know, how many of us are there that really watch this kind of programming? And he brought up CBS's cancellation of Walter Cronkite's Universe series, which was a science and technology magazine show that was on every Tuesday night. And that was probably the weakest part of my business plan of I didn't have the actual ratings data that was still held pretty secret by the uh, broadcast network. So there would be some reports that would be out in the news that I'd, I had. But I was starting to hear that question from a number of venture capitalists that I had approached down in the Washington area. And so um, I summoned up all the courage a young entrepreneur can have, and I called Walter Cronkite. I didn't get in touch with him immediately, but I got in touch with his assistant, who encouraged me to just send a, you know, a two, not more than a two-page letter describing um, you know, the Discovery Channel. And so I sent it to her, and lo and behold, she got, she got it to Walter, and then he surprised me by a phone call about a week later. And uh, he was so enthusiastic about the idea, invited me to New York. He'd been a childhood hero of mine, so I couldn't believe that I was sitting in Walter Cronkite's office, and he was offering his full support for the venture. And your wife raised a great question early on, which is, if your idea is so good, why isn't CBS doing it? Or why isn't uh, Ted Turner doing it? Or why isn't it? Ted Turner doing <laughs> yeah. it? Right. Well, I mean, that's a good question. I mean, why weren't they doing it? Well, again, I think part of the reason was they, they if you were in the broadcasting business, you put so much resources and energy into the primetime schedule. You know, maybe only three shows per night. And so for them to think about a full-time channel was fairly intimidating. And I had this kind of secret knowledge that I had from college that there were documentaries out in the world, like at the BBC, that could be accessed perhaps only with a license fee. So I wouldn't have to produce them originally in the beginning, which would be a $300,000 to $400,000 per hour investment, that I, instead I could license them for maybe 1000 to $3,000 per hour per year. And so, again, I think that those in the broadcasting business and they misdefined their business, too. They saw cable as something else. Mm -hmm. And I, I made one pitch to one broadcaster that I write about in the book. And he said, John, we're not interested. We're in the broadcasting business. So they defined their business by the delivery technology of the time. And so I've been careful. And at Discovery, we define our business as being in the business of satisfying curiosity. And we think that's a forever kind of business divorced from a particular delivery technology of the time. But let's take another step, though. Discovery could start, be very successful, and a larger business could come in and say, that's great, we'll move in now. We'll yeah. pay more, we'll... Yeah, I was extremely nervous in the beginning because you, you mentioned CBS. They had started up a um, cable service in the early days after, I think, around 1978, uh, 1980, called CBS Cable. It was uh, dedicated to performing arts. So they had operas and ballets. And it didn't get a lot of distribution, but it got into about four million households. And the management lost heart in the venture. And the CEO at the time, Thomas Wymans, uh, eventually killed it. But I was nervous. I was nervous that the CBS News Division would uh, plead with him, don't, don't kill it. Give it over to us, and we can program it with news or documentaries. So I, I was fearful. And, but it still t amazes me that the, the broadcasters, imagine ABC, who had a wonderful uh, brand in sports, ABC Wide World of Sports, right. that they didn't use their sports infrastructure to develop a 
uh, a sports channel. Right. And, and instead, they bought in, they now own ESPN, but they had to pay billions of dollars years later, you know, to acquire ESPN. Right. And, and, and you did. But I'm glad they didn't. W were you just lucky? <laughs> were you just lucky? I think so. I mean, there's a lot of luck. I mean, you can say you're clever and, you know, you're well prepared, but boy, there's some timing that in some ways can only be explained by just luck. But, you know, luck favors the prepared. Right. And so, you know, I've always felt I was prepared for any of these options that might come up. Now, let's move forward a couple of years. We're now in a period of merger mania in the media business. Time and Warner get together. Um, uh, CBS is doing deals with Westinghouse. Uh, everyone's doing deals, News Corp, Disney. Right. Um, Discovery stayed by itself. Was yeah. What did you not see or what was the opportunity that, that didn't come your way? Were you tempted to get in, no. involved? No. Well, after we got secure financing and we had some false starts on financing, but we were able to close the first round of financing of $5 million. But the second round was pooled by a consortium of cable operators uh, at the time, TCI, Cox, Newhouse, and United Artists. And so each of them put up $5 million and that $20 million got us to operational break even. So there was no need to merge after that. I mean, I was pretty financially secure and independent. I had big time backers now with these large corporations, you know, dedicated to funding to discovery. And so we were able to stay private. Uh, and we knew fundamentally that multi-channel television would sweep the planet. And not a lot of people were focused on that. You knew or you hoped? We, I think it's a stronger word. We just knew what was working here in the United States, that, that people just relished having more choices, having a movie channel, a sports channel, a discovery channel. You know, would people in the UK, Scandinavia, and Asia, are they different? And so, you know, we felt like it would really sweep the planet. And so then you think, well, if we don't have discovery channel around the world, then somebody will create. Mm -hmm. you know, a channel to fill that documentary nonfiction niche. And so we were the first to, to go overseas. So we started Discovery in the UK in 89, and then today we're in some 223 countries around the world. So you ask about mergers, uh, and my wife Maureen, when I told her the idea, and every entrepreneur has to tell some first person their idea. <laughs> it's kind of a perilous moment, especially if they're, you know, very, very discouraging. But, you know, she was very supportive. But then she thought, and then she asked, well, if this is such a great idea, why didn't Ted Turner do it? And so Ted Turner, years later, was asking himself the same question. And so I, there's a chapter in the book devoted to uh, when Ted Turner tried his best to merge with Discovery. But again, at that time, there's a feeling that you needed to have synergies, you needed to be connected to a distributor, that um, all these companies were bulking up and that somehow they would find some, some magic, that you really couldn't do it on your own. Um, did that thought occur to you at any point, that maybe you should become involved with someone who can guarantee distribution? Yeah, I think, well, that was the, the choice I made after the first round of financing. Um, was seeing the wisdom that if I teamed up with large cable distributors and they were investors, they would also be incented to widely distribute the service. Um, and so it, it was extremely helpful to have that, that sense of vertical integration within the company. And again, that gave me the financial security to think long term. So I didn't have to worry about, you know, we were all uh, confident that we were building a, a big corporation and there just wasn't a need to combine. Now there was a need to get scale and get larger. Mm -hmm. So uh, we felt that we couldn't stay a single network, especially as channel capacity increased and cable systems would maybe uh, progress to a point where there would be 200, 300, or 400 channels. So you don't want to be one channel right. in that multitude. So we acquired TLC in 91. Uh, we launched uh, uh, some six channels in 96 uh, through digital compression, like the Science Channel right. that people enjoy today, and uh, Animal Planet, for example. Who, who owned TLC at the time when you bought TLC it? TLC was owned by, I'll forget the name, it's, it, was, it was an Appalachian educational co-op, and it was um, uh, launched earlier than Discovery and had some distribution in the country. And um, we felt that if that channel had gotten into the hands 
of some other distributors like ABC, it could be problematic. Mm -hmm. And so for, largely for, for defensive reasons, we looked at it initially. Uh, but then we thought, you know what, we could, we could utilize this in a complementary fashion to discovery. We, you started off as a, an idealist, an entrepreneur, really had a, a, a particular idea for this channel, for Discovery Channel. When did you start to wrap your mind around the idea that you'd become the owner, the manager of a big business, of an entrenched business? I think it was after probably in 1995. I mean, we were successful around the world by that time. We had Discovery going in Europe and Asia. We were a multi-channel network. And then we just started thinking more as a global media company and uh, with a portfolio of networks. And so at that point, we knew we needed to break away from just the traditional documentary entertainment, respond to what the audiences wanted, and we had you know, an array of channels that we could address different interests. So for the people who just absolutely love science and technology, I'll raise my hand on that one, mm -hmm. then we had a great science channel. That's one of my favorite channels even today. You know, for people who are very curious about how people live different lives, we have TLC, which today, instead of the Learning Channel, I think of it as the Life Channel. Mm -hmm. And there, we feature program reality programming, like on the Amish, Honey Boo Boo, right. for people who are interested in, in that, that kind of content. And then we have Animal Planet, for people who are just in love with pets and nature, and then all the other channels that we've built. And we've been able to craft unique partnerships, like with Oprah on uh, OWN, for example, right. which is a new channel that uh, now is in its third year of operation. As someone who's been so interested in science all your, all your life and who's in, invested in Discovery Channel, I'm wondering when you look around and you see how many people don't believe in uh, evolution or believe that they're angels or believe that aliens uh, have visited Earth, do you think there's a science crisis, that science it needs to be um, elevated in the public mind, that somehow people still distrust it? Yeah, I really extent. do. And, you know, on the, like, evolution, it's like people didn't watch Cosmos. If you had any doubts, Carl Sagan really demonstrated, you know, quite convincingly. And I think, uh, hopefully, we're trying to contribute toward science education through the, um, Discovery, but most especially through the Science Channel. So we've been a big supporter of the STEM movement in mm -hmm. education, science, technology, engineering, and math. And, um, but it is frustrating when people don't understand the planet and people don't understand you know, the, you know, the formation of life, the evolution of life. And so uh, I, I think in so many ways, there may be as many as 50 to 60% of the population that's scientifically illiterate. Does more have to be done like, by the government or by other institutions? Well, I think one big hope is the middle schools because it's at that age where a lot of young people form you know, some of their critical thinking skills. It's a chance to get kids more involved in science education, but you have to make it interesting. And I think the more that we can have our educational system not be by rote memory, mm -hmm. but by hands-on experimentation. We have a discovery streaming service that's been extremely successful in the nation's classrooms, now in more than half of the nation's classrooms. And we have a new ebook, a textbook mm -hmm. uh, in science that's doing quite well. Like you, you were a, a pioneer in ebooks, right? Or you had yeah, aspirations? Was, yeah, in the early, early days of digital, we were thinking through what kind of content can be developed for these digital platforms. So in addition to television content, which was still a challenge to deliver digitally, um, it just seemed to me publishing magazines and books would be a breeze. So why aren't we talking about the Discovery uh, tablet <laughs> instead of uh, Apple? It was too, you know, I, I write in the book about sometimes being too early. So this was in 1992 when we wrote up the patents for a lot of um, uh, digital devices such as set-top converters that would um, allow you to select channels not by n numeric numbers anymore but by menus. Remarkably, no one had done that until mm -hmm. that time. And so we had a number of key patents that today, when you use your cable systems, you're using patents that, that we've developed uh, that are integrated in the remote controls as well as the TV sets. In that same period, um, we looked at the potential for portable electronic readers. Mm -hmm. And so we got uh, the earliest patent on the electronic book. This was in 1992, the patent issued in 94. They're only good for 20 years. 
at that time, what kept it from being portable, though, I had extensive meetings at Motorola, was the battery technology. I mean, you'd be dragging around something about the weight of two bricks to be able to power right. uh, an electronic book. And so, you know, we've utilized those patents today, of course, in our streaming service and our uh, books, and then we've combined them with Sony and Philips um, so that they're available you know, to other companies that want to utilize them. Right, right. As someone who's been looking at the future for so long, including the future of television, tell me, how much longer does the current model have? How much longer will we be buying a package of 100 or more channels for a monthly fee? Yeah, so we always look at, you know, as every revolution happens, from radio to TV. I remember when the television, when television came out, people thought nobody would go to the movie theaters anymore. And so I think there will be con these uh, industries will live concurrent with each other well into the future. But there will be different ways we do business. I mean, television today is much more user friendly. You know, most studies now confirm that people are happier with television. They can watch what they want to watch when they have the time to watch it because of the DVRs. You know, it used to be 20 years ago. You had to compromise your viewing. If mm -hmm. something wasn't good on at the time, you had to go surfing through 100 200 channels and find some least objectionable, objectionable programming, which was a substitute for what you really wanted to watch. But now we can all record and have the best of what we define as content on TV available. So that's helpful. It is, and it's progressing to the point where there'll be eventually, four, five, six years from now, cloud servers Mm -hmm. where you can have the content of a channel like A&E or History or Discovery, any of our services that lay resident on these massive uh, cloud servers that people can access things deep in our library. So if you're curious about how the Panama Canal mm -hmm. was built, I know we have three or four documentaries that you could dive deep into uh, our archive and retrieve. So I think television, I think we're approaching almost a new golden age of, of, of TV. And I'm so proud of our industry, the cable industry. If you look at what AMC is producing in such series like The Killing mm -hmm. and some others, and TNT is doing a great original content, so is Bravo and USA Network. So even on the fiction side and on the nonfiction side, we're all bringing new people to cable. We're able to produce better and better content because the eyeballs are shifting from broadcast to cable. But we know on the horizon is more and more usage and accessing of the content through the internet. Can what will happen to your channels though when we get to a point where I can say I want to buy Discovery, I don't want to buy TLC, I want to buy CNN, I don't want to buy Spike. Yeah, so you're you're talking about the world of a la carte. Correct. So what each of us when you start a cable network, you have to decide do you want to pay service be a la carte premium like HBO? And the moment you decide that, then you're going to be a small subset of the entire universe. And so advertising is not much of a possibility. And the most successful pay service in the history of the world is HBO. And there are about 27 million households. Discovery's in 100 million. And with 100 million distribution, we have a heavy subsidy of advertising. So we've all done the math. Mm -hmm. So if, you, if we had to... Um, if we could, you know, had the resources to produce the same amount of content that we do now on Discovery, you'd have to pay about eight dollars a month. Eight dollars for Discovery alone. For Discovery alone. So we've all done the math. And so, if you look at it naively and mm -hmm. don't look deeply at the twenty billion dollars plus that's spent on basic cable advertising, which is a huge subsidy, so that CNN doesn't cost you seven or eight dollars. Discovery or TLC doesn't cost you seven or eight dollars each. You know, it would be in enormously disruptive. So, we think the pay, the basic bundled model, that ecosystem, is probably the most economic way for people to enjoy a variety of content on cable. We think that will stay for quite a while. Quite a while, t five years, ten years. Well, it's hard to see a model that would disrupt if you can continue to provide for eighty or ninety dollars a month you know, hundreds of more ch or more channels that we know on an individual basis would just be prohibitive. That's almost, that's a winning proposition. But there's stresses on the system, and the stress on the system right now is sports programming. So you have sports networks who are bidding up 
you know, the price of NFL and all the sports, and that's layering on additional wholesale costs that's now currently being passed along the whole user base, regardless of whether consumers want it or not. Right. And so that, that's a situation that has to be dealt with over the next two or three years. Well, I, I could ask you a dozen more questions right away, but I know that there's some people in the audience who have some questions. Hi, thanks so much for being here. Oh, um, sure. On the question of education, it seems like the liberal arts are um, being squeezed very tight um, in an effort to increase STEM education um, in K-12 and um, in universities. Um, do you have um, any viewpoints on um, how the liberal arts can be preserved um, in the face of challenges facing them, um, or how um, things such as history can be used uh, to get more students interested in science, technology, and engineering? Yeah. I mean, that's an interesting question, and some of you may have read um, in the New York Times, there was a great opinion piece about the decline of uh, English majors, for example. And so I found, to my pleasant surprise, there were a number of us in the cable industry that were history majors. Ted Turner, John Cook, who was the, the leader of the Disney Channel for a long time. Um, I think history, the humanities, give us a perspective on life, you know, that you'll never get in, in, in some of the hard sciences if you're very much focused. Um, if you go through a, a four years of history study, you're going to do a lot of papers, you're going to do a lot of trend analysis. I know in my own experience, you know, I've, I've been able, I think, to have, you know, been able to predict some future outcomes by just looking at trends in the past. And so at Discovery, we've always been convinced that the consumer, for example, will migrate toward viewing platforms that offer closer to reality experiences. That may seem so obvious, but it's behind this progression from radio to television to color, black and white television to color, uh, to high definition to 3D, ultimately 3D without glasses, ultimately uh, to what I call retinal definition 3D television where the visual image will match what we're all seeing today uh, with our retina. And so those are trends that I think a good, well grounding in history where you're trained to observe trends in society uh, is extremely helpful. So that's why even though we're a supporter of a STEM, I, uh, the STEM you know, core curriculum, that I think we would, uh, it would be problematic if the country didn't stay you know, on course and offering rich, uh, a variety of uh, humanities courses in colleges. To be, you know, to, to be an educated person, you need to be so well-rounded and not just be so focused in a particular science area um, and not come away with knowledge about geography and cultures around the world as well. Anyway, my two cents worth. Yeah, this is also about education. Um, I think there's a certain stigma attached to sort of you said middle schoolers are really important right. to sort of educate in the sciences and stuff. And I think there's a certain stigma, especially in America, about sort of sitting a kid down in front of the TV instead of parenting them. Um, but I think, you know, I think the irony of that is there could be a lot of great things out there for them right. um, on TV, like Discovery. Um, how do you think you sort of bridge that gap, sort of explain to parents, um, explain to kids even, that there is a lot out there for them. Yeah. I think one of the values of video and television is it can, and we've studied this because with television in the classroom and television in the home, you can showcase the world. You know, a kid who's 12 or 13 years old can see someone, you know, who's hard at work in a research laboratory who's maybe 24, 25 years old. And, and if we can uh, use television to introduce children to the possibilities in life, then I, hopefully they'll study harder. But I think one of the biggest challenges, though, is, you know, Einstein once made that famous remark about he, he thought it was a miracle that curiosity wasn't killed, you know, by the age 16, by the educational system. And so, again, there's so much rote learning that we're still in high schools today that, you, you know, you couldn't tell a difference from 20 or 30 years ago. And we've got to employ these new technologies that bring the power of multimedia, you know, to kids, you know, and interactive multimedia. Because, you, you know, so many kids learn more if all of their senses are fully engaged around a topic. So I think it's more, more multimedia, more on-demand interactive uh, material. To uh, kind of continue off that question and your answer, what kind of 
curriculum have you put in place or what kind of, when you get new content, do you have like a checklist of what needs to be approved? Are you pushing the mark with mm -hmm. the documentaries that you show? I mean, I'm sure we've all been in school where we've seen dreadful documentaries <laughs> yeah, that exactly. teach us absolutely nothing and put us to sleep. And that's obviously not what the Discovery Channel does, but I'm wondering how much you push that education for, you know, new things coming out. Well, it started from the very beginning. Our first telephone call after we went on the air on June 17th, 1985, was from a teacher in Kansas. And we went on the air at 3 o'clock, and by 3.10, the phone was ringing. And she had a simple question. She said, can I tape this show? It was called Iceberg Alley, and show it to in her earth science class. And it kind of puzzled us. We didn't know if we had the educational rights at that moment, especially for that show. So for three decades now, we have studied the interest of teachers. And so we've addressed that by, uh, number one, they don't want long form content, not more than say 30 minutes. And most often it's short form in five, you know, six or seven minutes. And so what we've done is create a service called Discovery Scre uh, Streaming, which has over 20,000 titles that teachers can access on a random access basis in, her, in their classroom. And to get that to be useful for schools, we've had to tailor it and customize it for all 50 states. So this is a challenge, because if you teach earth science in Kansas, your curriculum is different than what's taught in Florida. And so it's an incredible job that we've had to go to to tailor our content so that every teacher in every state in sciences the, and, and mathematics and in all the social studies can, can utilize it. So this is a big priority for us. So you can uh, visit our website on Discovery Education and you'll see a sample of Discovery Streaming Service. But in addition to the video, we, need to, uh, we provide uh, student uh, guides as well as teacher guides because you have to have trained teachers who can utilize the talent uh, or the technology that we have available today. Another question, does that frustrate you, knowing that you have to tailor curriculums per state, knowing that it's almost biased on what they're choosing to teach to each you know, school system? I, f I mean, especially, you said you're pro-evolution and to not believe in evolution. I mean, I feel like as someone that's pushing education so much and pushing knowledge, it's to have that, I mean, I guess you gotta pick and choose your yeah, battles there is. on that. But. <laughs> yeah, we do have to pick and choose, but it's, um, what we have to do is provide the best quality science content that we have, and we have to trust that over time, I think the one step forward is the new core curriculum, which you know, the federal government is, is pushing, and hopefully the states will adopt at least a core curriculum in the sciences that will put some of those uh, fragmented problems behind us. So I think there is hope. Um, so I just wanted to ask you, you know, as you grew your network and as you guys realized that you were really onto something, you probably were under a lot of pressure from, you know, advertisers or financers. So what kind of support structure did you use? And, you know, over the years, have you kind of picked up uh, your own like sort of special team that you work with deep inside Discovery to make sure everything you want to do happens? And are there certain people or, you know, you know, even things like journaling that you lean on to kind of get that pressure out? That's a good question. And, you know, you want to, you know, who do you want to work with in life? People, you know, um, and so it's very important from top to bottom that we have a cohesive organization that's rallied, you know, behind the cause of discovery. We, def we define our business as being in the business of satisfying curiosity. We think that's a noble undertaking. Um, and so people rally behind that, but it starts at the board level. And I've just been so fortunate to have long term partners that I've been with since 1986 uh, and we've you know we've never had a split vote on our board we've always talked things through it doesn't mean we haven't had spirited discussions but in the end we've been able to rally behind you know a common strategy you know to grow the company and I think that's filtered down through the organization and then we have to go through and you know changes and transitions and um, we've done that uh, but I think we have one of the the best management teams in place today but that's a continuing challenge is to make sure everybody's pulling uh, in the same direction. Hi, Hi. Uh, you've been talking about all the content you produce for Discovery Streaming and then there's all the shows that you self-produce. Uh, that's a lot of content and a lot of information. Who does the vetting? Who does your copy editing? So, um, we produce 
uh, the lion's share of our content. And so we're still open to acquisitions, uh, but they're carefully screened. And so if you look at uh, within discovery programming, we have a lot of people who are executive producers and their role in life um, is to meet to, uh, together with uh, in development committee meetings, um, design new topics that we want to explore. And then we typically uh, will work with outside producers to accomplish you know, those objectives. Uh, but we, we have a senior executive producer that's assigned to every project. And that person has delegated the authority of the company to make sure that that resulting content is going to meet our standards. And so it's, um, we delegate a lot to our executive producers. And that's that first credit you'll see roll after a discovery show. Thanks. So Shark Week is quite a uh, common up. American <laughs> phrase. <laughs> I was wondering when that was going to come up. <laughs> and I'm curious to know um, if you guys quite knew what you had on your hands the first Shark Week no, came out. No, we didn't. And, um, you'll see this in the book because it was, um, it was in 1987. And uh, from time to time, we like to go away and just take the staff away from the office and go on a retreat. And sometimes it's off in nature or someplace, you know, outside in a rural area. Um, but other times uh, we, we, take, we went into an urban area. We went right in downtown Washington. I treated the staff who had worked so hard on a lot of projects to a retreat at the Hay Adams Hotel, overlooked the White House. And so there was a living room setting that we had. Um, and so we were just going around discussing what could we do? What's a new programming idea? And one of our young uh, programmers, Steve Cheskin, he raised his hand. He said, you know how all these independent stations will have Marilyn Monroe Week or John Wayne Week? And he said, what if we had Shark Week? <laughs> and the moment he said that, it was just, you know, we all smiled and it was like funny but brilliant. <laughs> And then we spent, and then everybody said, well, why about Lion Week? And, and so it was, it was interesting. So, but Shark Week really took hold. And so we said, you know what, let's give it a try next summer. And it went on, and it has been a fixture on the air worldwide since then, and a huge hit. And, you know, people throw parties around Shark Week, so we love it. You, you don't have any similar plans with Nick Walenda, do you? <laughs> yeah, Nick Walenda week. I tell you, that was, I, I didn't think I could hold my breath for 23 minutes, but I managed to. That was the most remarkable display of skill and courage that I think the world has ever seen. So we're real proud that Nick made it. <laughs> and you like the ratings, too. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Great. Well, I think that's it for the questions. Thank you so much for coming. I know it's beautiful weather out here. And, uh, thank you all. I appreciate you joining us. John, thank you. Thank you.